Well, good afternoon. Welcome to this week's Facebook Live. I'm Justin Westmiller, the Director for Homeland Security and Emergency Management. And I'm Annette Mercatant from St. Clair County Health Department. So I think, right, Justin, you're going to start gonna... out with the data. Mm -hmm. Yep. Again, this week, we're going to switch it up a little bit, and I'm going to run the data down. So total to date, we have 5,566 total cases. Uh, we have 286 total hospitalized. And to date, we are at 105 deaths with 2,179 people recovered. And Doc, we wanted to talk just a second before we switch on, on deaths. You had some input on that? Um, yeah, so I, I think it's important to recognize that statewide, um, the state reports 34% of all deaths have been among, among nursing home, home residents. And so far, um, among all of our deaths, 27% have been on uh, among nursing home residents. Uh, the peak of our, our our deaths were in the spring, but last month we we had a total um, of 31 deaths reported just in the month of November. So I bring that up only because following high rises and hospitalizations, we do expect death rates to go up, and we're watching that very closely uh, as an important factor on on the outcomes of this of this uh, transmission, the surge. So. Thanks, Doctor. All right, back to the numbers. So 877 new cases in the last seven days. We're averaging 125 cases per day uh, with 822 average tests per day. And currently we're at 17.3% positive on those tests. What, are, what is our positivity rate? 17.3%. 73 percent Thank you. Yep. That's pretty high. Yeah, and so here's the graph. And as you can see, last week we uh, we started to trend down a little bit, and now we're we're trending back upwards again. Uh, so we're still in a in a high range, a very high range, and uh, and we're just waiting to get on the other side of that. This is our percent positive for testing. As you can see, uh, we continue an upward trend there on the positivity line. So. Uh, and that coincides with the number of with the number of active cases we're getting daily. And then finally, our uh, dashboard numbers at the health department, uh, where you can find this information all day, every day, and it is updated daily. So all right. I want to start with some questions that came in earlier, or uh, we had quite a few questions that came in last night. So you ready? Yeah. When you All right. Are. All right. These are questions that came in last night. Um, okay. Justin, my husband went into a party store and he was the only one wearing a mask, including workers. Um, what do we do? So you really have two. There's two steps there. One, uh, if you don't feel safe, don't go there. Right. Go and go somewhere else, whether it's eating or shopping or whatever. Uh, you have other options. So that may be potentially be an answer. And then also let us know if that's happening somewhere. Let the health department know via their reporting system and uh, and and we'll take it from there. And people can submit a complaint at scchealth.co. Yes. Okay, next question. Um, vaccine information. Did any of the people that were in the vaccine trials have pre-existing conditions or were they all considered healthy without any pre-existing conditions? Well, we don't know the details of that until we have the release of information. I expect that we will have some of that information uh, once the FDA has approved it and the ACIP has uh, done the review. Uh, but from my understanding, there actually were people with pre-existing conditions. When you have a clinical trial of 30 to 40,000 people, um, it's inevitable that some of them um, have problems, medical problems. Some of them um, get pregnant while uh, they're, you know, uh, while they're during the vaccine trial. So we will see some data on, on some of these types of conditions, whether it'll be enough data to reassure us or tell us exactly what uh, we should know about it is a different story, but uh, we will have some further information before the vaccines are distributed. So speaking kind of along those lines, are those receiving dialysis and those professionals caring for them going to be considered high priority for the vaccine? Sure. 
Yeah. So we'll go back to the vaccine. The first round of vaccine distribution, since it's going to come out in a very short supply, is going to be focused on our healthcare workers to keep them functioning, keep them in the hospitals, in the clinics, so that they can take care of sick people. Without the doctors and the nurses and the healthcare people, sick people don't get any care. Uh, the second tier will be our first responders. Um, oh, I should add to that first tier is also our nursing home uh, faculty or staff and, and residents, because I mentioned that the very high mortality rates in, in those situations and the way the virus can just get out of control so quickly there. And then and then we would be focusing on our police and our fire and our essential workers that way that we can't do without. Following that will be patients at high risk. So uh, patients that have chronic medical conditions are not going to be in the very first tier. And that's going to be difficult. It's going to be very difficult. Um, with the rationing of this vaccine, uh, it's always uh, ethically and emotionally hard, and we're all going to just have to really walk through this and be very patient with it. Okay, we'll switch gears for a minute. Uh, Justin, is it possible to implement shopping hours for those who do wear masks? So, no, it's not possible to to work with each individual shopping center to set up special hours. But what we do know is it's required by law right now to wear a mask in, in a public setting, whether it be outdoor with others that aren't in your family or indoors uh, in a situation where there are other people around. So knowing that uh, it, it's required for everybody all the time. There are a few very small um, exceptions, but but for the most part, it's required everywhere. So let's answer a few more mask questions. Um, people have been seeing a lot of people doing half masking. Does this do the community any good at all if you're not wearing your mask properly? No. So uh, you need to wear it properly over your nose and your mouth to ensure that you're getting the best protection possible. Uh, this is a respiratory droplet uh the virus and that's how it's transmitted so if you're not covering both uh you could be either putting it out or taking it in okay and then let's shift over to face shields because that's been another popular question do clear face shields work as well as mask they they do not uh a, a mask is something that covers the nose and mouth and a face shield allows things to escape, a face shield by itself allows things to escape out the sides and the top and bottom. So uh, you can use a face shield in concert with a face covering, uh, but you can, it's not, uh, you're not supposed to use it just by itself. Okay. Um, we know cases are high, but somebody wants to know they need to get a root canal and is it safe to go and get those kind of things done? Well, yeah, so, I, I think so. I, I think so, and I guess only because I know our dentists have uh, taken uh, this infection control process very seriously. Uh, it's, it, it's not likely you're going to even see the, the, your face of the dentist or any of their hygienists because uh, they wear full PPE all the time, uh, and they are, are very conscientious about that. So if you need a medical condition, I would encourage you to follow through with that. Um, if you're not feeling well and you feel like you have COVID or you're ill, certainly call ahead and be tested and maybe postpone it for that reason. But if you're well, I believe that you're in good shape to receive your um, your medical care and your dental care at this time. Yeah, and okay. I was going to say that I just got one done two weeks ago uh, and was felt completely safe the whole time. So, you know, I totally agree with Dr. Marcoton on this. Okay. Thank you. Um, next question. We have a few more vaccine questions. Um, can you please clarify about the new vaccine? Does does it do something that alters DNA? Am I accurate? Thanks for taking my okay. question. Okay. Yeah. So there's going to be actually a whole bunch of new vaccines. I think there's over 70 in clinical trials right now. But the first two that are coming out are both called mRNA vaccines. And it's a new technology where you have a single strand of messenger RNA which is a type of genetic coding that uh, codes for a certain protein. And it's just the RNA sequence that codes for the spike protein of the COVID virus. And we know that that protein 
uh, spike is what gets the virus into our, attaches to our cells and allows the virus to go into our cells and replicate and infect us. So if you block that protein spike uh, using your immune system, then you block getting an infection from the virus. So mRNA technology is a fabulous new technology. It is what has allowed us to um, so rapidly develop all this vaccine. We do not have to grow virus. So normally vaccines are using parts of a virus or they're using uh, inactivated virus. And so you have to grow a bunch of virus and then you have to uh, take it apart and use it to your vaccine. This, this mRNA technology just does not use any viral particles whatsoever. It just uses that sequence. The mRNA goes into your muscle cell, but never enters your nucleus. So it never integrates with your genetic material. It works by staying in the cytoplasm outside of the nucleus and using your own mitochondrial and ribosomal uh, mechanisms that your cell has to make its own protein. And it generates the spike protein using your cellular mechanisms, but not your genetics. And um, there's some wonderful videos out there. Um, we're going to try to put some um, some stuff on our website that you can watch, and I'll explain this um, so that you understand a little bit better. But it's it's absolutely brilliant technology, and it is uh, not something that's going to integrate or interfere with your DNA in any way. In fact. Uh, Previous vaccines using inactivated or even um, parts of did more with that because that's how viral particles, remember, replicate. They go into your body, they go into your cells, and viral particles do go then in, integrate into your genetics and reproduce and then kill you. So um, this vaccine, as far as I'm concerned, is going to be spectacularly much safer than the virus, the real virus ever, ever will be. Okay, so somebody asked, if you get the COVID virus after you have the COVID vaccine, can you still transmit the virus to another person? Well, yeah, if you actually get infected despite having the vaccine, you can still be infectious, of course. Um, nothing is 100%. Um, it remains to be, it, it still remains uh, to be understood a little bit from my perspective, whether the vaccine will prevent primary infection or just serious infection. But we are um, hoping, and I understand that it will prevent transmission of infection as well. So we'll know more about that when we start seeing the clinical trial data. Uh, somebody asked, will either of you be getting the vaccine when it comes out? Yes. Heck yeah. So, so neither Justin and I are direct healthcare workers. We'll be in a kind of a second tier. Um, my focus will be getting um, our vaccinators vaccinated. Um, plus, since I just had COVID, um, I feel like I can take a step back in this uh, precious resource and, and, and wait a few months since I'm assuming I'm going to have a little bit of, of benefit for, for the first 90 days to um, avoid it. But yes, absolutely. And if people need to see me get the vaccine, just have more faith in it, I'll be more than happy to do that. Okay. Yeah. And, and I'm the same. I, I'm willing to, to video it, put it on Facebook Live, put it out there as much as possible. Um, I'm ready to make that happen. And here's, and here's why I can say that, because I know that the process that is this is going through in order to get approved and the process that's happening in order for us to get the information is the same process that's used for every vaccine that's ever been licensed. And there is no safety uh, aspect of that that's been skipped or sped through. So if we know all that information before we actually receive the vaccine, I think will be, I will be very confident that those, um, that what's going to happen with it. Okay. And somebody asked if you had confidence in the vaccine and it sounds like you do. Yes. Okay. So far. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So here's a question about schools. Why are we not closing the elementary schools that are still open? You have the power <clears throat> to override a school district's decision to remain open. Correct. Not really. Uh, no. So, um, you know, I can do, I can cease and desist and order things shut or whatever, but that's, that's not the same as closing a school district. And as you know, the governor did this and it was repealed. And, and now the, this, the MDHHS has made choices to keep uh, younger kids in school, but keep the older kids out. And that's partly is primarily because of the data that shows who's getting infected and, and how the virus is spreading. 
Uh, but we do know that if done correctly, and I'll say this again, if done correctly, kids can go to school safely. It is not a bad thing to have your kids in school if everything is being controlled and monitored and closely kept watch. Um, in fact, many people, and myself included, in many cases, school is the best place for kids, even during a pandemic. I'll stand by that. Now, right now, we're in this huge spike and this, everything's kind of losing it. I, I, I would agree that right now is a good time to just kind of keep the status quo and not expand anything any further. Uh, but uh, school in itself, if you notice, in, in the middle of the spike in New York City, kids are going back to school. And, and there are ways to do that so that they can get their education and uh, we can, um, you know, do the best for our kids. Somebody also just added, um, if you receive your first dose of the vaccine, do you have to use the same manufacturer for the second? Yes. Yeah, you will. I think when we get closer to having the vaccine here, we'll need to do a whole episode on vaccine for the community as well. Yeah. So more to come on that. Okay. So somebody asked, um, they, they, see a people, they see people, a lot of people wearing dirty masks. Is there a resource in our community for people to get free masks? There was supposed to be. I don't know what happened to that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we were supposed so, to get masks. I don't know what happened with that. Yeah, the state is working on, yeah, the state is working on uh, a couple different deliveries uh, that of masks that were made by our auto manufacturers. And, uh, and once we get those, we can make some of those available and we will make some of those available to the public. Uh, there's also, go ahead, Doc. Well, I was just going to say at the beginning of this, uh, we were getting all kinds of people volunteering to make masks and we were having people dropped right. off. And what I could say, please do that again. Uh, what a great way to contribute towards the wellness of your community. Uh, people do get tired of masks and washing them and it will be wonderful to have another mask collection community effort to do that um and we would be more than happy to to um facilitate right the pickups and the distribution yeah. of that so uh please let us know give us a drop drop us a line at covid19 uh at st Clair County org and uh we can talk okay we're going to shift over to some testing questions that we have uh, someone recently had a rapid test done and they took a second sample to be sent to the lab for confirmation if the rapid was positive and the lab results are positive, does that mean this one positive person actually gets counted twice in the number of cases that are reported? Wow. We've answered that question a million times. If you, one person, I don't care if you get tested 20 times, will get counted as one case, uh, especially if it's within the first 90 days. Uh, we use any test within 90 days as one individual. It gets merged together in one. It may for a, a day or two be there, but it gets merged together. Unless you are purposely manipulating the system and going and putting different names down for every test you have. And I think that's well, potentially a, a very, very, very tiny uh, risk of that. So no, if, if you get tested multiple times uh, during an illness, you will get you will get counted as one case. So once you test positive, how long does it take to test negative? And when should you test for antibodies? It varies. So the PCR test can stay positive for a long time, which is why we wait. We recommend waiting at least 90 days to have another test. Um, antigen tests don't tend to stay positive very long. They're much less sensitive. Uh, they'll frequently be positive during the first four, day, four or five days of illness. And then if you go later on, it'll be negative. Um, so it varies a lot from test to test and, and when you're uh, redoing it. Uh, the antibody test, who knows? We don't know. Uh, and that's why we really aren't recommending using antibodies for any clinical value. Um, uh, in, a, in a research setting, we may have some antibody used to find immune responses, but the, um, the, the, the commercial antibody tests, um, all I can say is we really don't know when we would expect an IgG or IgM to develop. We don't know how protective it is and we don't know how long it'll last. Okay, thank you. Who is a candidate to donate plasma for COVID and how do you do this? I haven't heard about plasma donation now for a while. And I think part of that is because the initial clinical trials of, of plasma use, convalescent plasma, were not very uh, good. 
um, the clinical trials did not show a whole lot of efficacy or improvement. I don't know if they've given up on that, but certainly the hype and the uh, excitement about that has, has waned. I have not been hearing much about it. Okay. Um, is it safe for grandparents to be around their grandkids that are going to school? Depends. Um, is it, so are they in the same household? Um, you know, is, do, I, do you have your own pod? Um, are the kids, um, when they go to school, are they all wearing masks? Are they distancing themselves? Is the school following good protocols to keep the kids separate and, you know, doing the right things? If, if those things are all happening, um, I would say you're probably about as safe as anywhere else. Um, if you aren't confident that when they go to school that they are uh, following the right precautions, um, it might be different. And I'd also consider uh, your own underlying um, health risks as well. And, and if I can add to that too real quick, remember you're not safe right now. You're just safer depending on, on the actions you take and, and where you put yourself. So, uh, you know, a lot of people ask, how can we be safe doing this or that? Right now, it's the amount of risk you're, you're willing to accept. Okay. Um, at what location in the community do you plan on having the vaccine administered? When we find out, we'll tell you. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah honestly, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's a trick. You know, we, we, initially, these are all going to be closed pods. So initially, vaccine is going to be distributed uh, by, uh, you know, by health care workers to other health care workers. So there will not be any kind of public space. Uh, when we get to that point, uh, we will let you know. Okay. And we um, have many potential sites, uh, but but it's not the right time yet to put it out. Yeah. Oh, and I, yeah, I would say, yeah, we know that we want to get to all the corners of our, our community and, and we will work very hard to make uh, the vaccine available to you. That's for sure. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about data because there's been some questions about the data again. Are the numbers that are shown in our data reports actual new cases or are they existing cases? They're both. The top <laughs> line shows the total and then um if you yeah go there you go so the top line shows the totals and then the bottom line shows the changes in the last seven days so we're uh you know everybody involved in this from our data folks to doc and i are all doing the best we can with the data uh, and making sure everybody has the most up-to-date data as possible and it's right Okay. Yeah, I wonder with the questions of the data, whether it's just really hard for people to understand numbers. And it is. Sometimes it's very hard. And epidemiology is not simple math. It, it really, this is not simple surveillance. It's real time. I've talked about this a million times. So I understand why it's confusing. But I do want to make a point. If, if one thing to ask if you're not sure and you understand, and I think sometimes no matter how many times we explain it, it's because it's hard why I hire people to do our data. Um, and we have data, you know, people that are PhD trained all the way up through our system that, that do this. And even they struggle and change their data collection process. So I get it. The other thing is to look at data that you don't understand and use it as a reason why you don't believe in it. And I just caution you for that because um, this is the most valid information and data we can do. We're trying our hardest to make it accessible and, and understandable to you, but it is not a, a worldwide or, or countrywide conspiracy to inflate or lie or cover something up. This is, this is all real and, you know, the numbers don't lie. They don't lie. They, they may be off, they, we may shift them, but uh, they're not being used to specifically manipulate a, 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 a situation, okay? I just had so to say that. Sometimes I feel like that's why they're asking is because I don't believe these numbers. Somebody's making it up. We're not. And, and we've seen uh, we've seen lately too a shift with people uh, questioning again about the the causes of death with COVID. Are anyone dying these days um, marked as a COVID death? No. So again, people are confused about that. 
If anything, we are undercounting cases and we are undercounting yeah. deaths, if anything. Because we know people die and don't get tested or they get, they die and some other cause of death will be attributed to it. Um, and there is just no way you can look at the situation. Just if you go into any hospital, probably in the nation right now and look around, I don't think you'll really question the lethality and the seriousness of this virus. Um, this virus is deadly. It's a, it's a, horrible virus. Um, and I and going back to my personal story, I'm still sick 13 days into this and I'm still struggling. This is not a joke. It's not made up. And, um, you know, if you've heard this number and see this number over here, uh, you just have to kind of chalk that up to the fact that real time d data collection and surveillance is not perfect and that, um, but it is a good reflection, an accurate reflection of what's happening. Okay, thank you. Someone asked, what is the current CT or cycle threshold number in St. Clair County? But they may have meant reproduction number, but they said CT number. Threshold yeah, I number. apologize that Justin got that one. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know that I, uh, uh, so people, so on. I just mentioned that I'm not an epidemiologist and I'm not a data, I'm just a doctor. 1.03. There we go. It's now, apparently it's down a little bit. Um, and those monitor, those numbers are monitored by our number of people. And I think they just reflect the fact that they go up and down with the transmission. But sorry, if you want right. something more specific than that, you'll have to write in. I'll have to pass it along to the people who understand those things. Okay. And, thank and you. hopefully by now you figured out that one is a scientist and the other one just makes things happen. So that's that's how we break <laughs> that's how we break up all this work. And I'm a medical doctor, not an epidemiologist. Okay. So right. you know, we just have to kind of keep that in perspective. It takes it takes this whole team to try and put this together. So, but if also, if I understand the intention of your question, it's a lot easier to answer it. If I, if I, you know, understand, are you trying to understand is the, is the transmission better or worse or something like that, then it, it helps me a little bit understand where to go with it. So. Okay. We've got some questions about <laughs> symptoms. And I know you've gone over these in the past, but these could have been from new um, viewers. If the cough persists, past the 10 day isolation period, are you still contagious? Depends. Um, it is possible to remain contagious. Some people do remain contagious beyond 10 days, but typically you'll have more than a cough. Um, you know, you'll have, you'll still have a lot of body aches and fevers. These are usually people are immune compromised and you'll be under the, hopefully under the care of a, a physician who can guide you with that. Um, the cough, I can tell you, persists, as does the loss of taste and smell. These are not things that seem, seem to go away like, like within days. So I would say that the 10-day rule from the onset of your symptoms is still a pretty good way of of, of estimating when you're still contagious or not. I mean, if you still feel really lousy, give it a few more days. But if your fever is gone, your your energy is coming back, um, you know, um, those things are all better. It's been a full 10 days. I would be comfortable with you going back to work or, or school or whatever the situation is. So that kind of leads into the next question. Someone said if they've already had COVID and their symptoms are gone, when can they meet safely again with their kids or grandkids? And how long days. do the antibodies Okay. And how long do you know how long the antibodies last? No, it's got nothing to do with antibodies. It's just what we know about uh, the potential of the virus still spreading. Um, and like I said, the antibodies uh, sometimes don't show up for weeks. We just don't know enough about the antibody response uh, right now to tell you how to use that to your advantage. I wouldn't rely on that. I would just rely on the on the, the clinical time. And do we know if you've had COVID before, can you get it again? This is a common question too. We don't know for sure. We do know that there are uh, rare cases that have have been documented to be reinfected. Uh, we don't we don't think it's common, uh, but again, this is a brand new virus and. Um, We've had kind of our hands full with a lot of things. So there's a few you know, details uh, always. But um, 
probably there is some short-term immunity, okay? I think most people would um, anticipate that. And like everything, there are probably people who don't mount immunity and some that do and some that last longer and that that's the part we don't really understand but the question is can you get reinfected the answer is yes you can i we just don't know um how likely it is it's probably pretty uncommon okay now we're on to all um the live questions as well okay, okay so um somebody said that if you want the community to make masks, we should post something on our social media asking people to make them. So we yeah, can do that. Go for it. I think I think doing things for positive for the community is a win-win, man. I'd love to see that. Okay, somebody yeah, asked if you, if your rapid test was positive, should you get another test? I I, I wouldn't. Um I think there's enough disease around that if you're positive, you can safely assume you're positive. And if you're not positive three days later, it doesn't mean you're not positive. It just means maybe the antigen um, isn't high enough anymore in your system to detect it. It's the, the rapid antigen tests are, are not as sensitive. So they can miss uh, infection um, pretty quickly after that peak. So I would get a test, and if it looks like a duck and smells like a duck and walks like a duck, it's a duck. Uh, if you feel, if you've been near somebody that has COVID, which at this point everyone has, okay, I don't care where you go, there's a very good chance you're had, having an exposure. And if you start to feel ill and have a positive rapid test, I would say you got COVID. Okay. Somebody asks, why does it take so long for a facility to get a waiver to start testing? Oh, God, because a whole thousands of thousands of facilities are all trying to get waivers. Everything yeah. in our system is getting bogged down. This is a worldwide pandemic. So it, it's not like the system just can expand to accommodate all the things that are needed. Um, even the things that are needed, we are having trouble expanding. So uh, it is it is a difficult process. Our data systems are bogged down. They're crashing all the time. Um, you know, the regulatory systems are bogged down. Uh, it's it's just the way it's going to be, people. I mean, we're we're in a pandemic. OK, next question. Why are healthcare workers that test positive allowed to still work if they are mild cases? Well, they're, they're not supposed to work if they're cases, if they're sick. Okay, if you're sick, you shouldn't be working. Uh, healthcare workers are allowed to work if they're quarantined, if they're exposed and not sick, under very tight conditions, under close scrutiny. Now, we have such a critical shortage right now of certain kinds of healthcare workers that if they couldn't come in, if they were feeling well, there would be literally no one to take care of uh, the individuals in the facility. And so we have very um, specific situations where positive individuals <clears throat> that are actually well, they shouldn't be sick, positive individuals are allowed to work just with positive COVID patients. And that is a very um, unique and special situation. And typically, healthcare workers, if they're positive, they should not be working until their 10 days are up. They are allowed to work if they're just exposed and they're being monitored and that's because we need them so desperately okay um back to the vaccines again um are the vaccinations live viruses you already covered this but um someone wants to know if they are if you receive it would you be able to spread it well number one i don't believe there are any live viruses that are even being um, used or manufactured for this. And I guess we'll know more as more of these trials come out. But number two, even a live virus vaccine does not spread uh, the disease. Um, it is changed to the, to, to the place where it can mimic the disease to allow your immune system to respond, but um, the disease is not spread. If it could, uh, they wouldn't license the vaccine. It's doesn't happen now. I, 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 you guys can argue with me. There's been some situations historically, polio, for, live polio vaccine had a tendency to cause very rare transmission. But those kinds of things are certainly not part of our, our current vaccine um, armamentarium. Okay. How do you report recovery if you tested positive and have recovered? How do you let the health department know? 
Uh, I guess we're assuming uh, you recovered if you're not dead in 30 days, right? <laughs> Is that how we're doing it? The person yeah. that I'm I, you know, I don't know that it's that important to let us know. I mean, we're assuming people are recovering if they're not dying. Um, and so um, back in the day when we were following our case investigations, beginning to end, we would call and we would take you out when you were feeling uh, better. And we knew that that clinical time frame was had gone by. Uh, but as we reported several times now, we're not really doing that um, <clears throat> to the extent we we can't do that anymore. So um, thank you for offering that and thank you for providing. But I think uh, I the most I could say, if you want to send some information to us and you think it is um, important for us, just send it along on that COVID-19 um, email. That's our best approach. And I, I guess it's a good time to also say that we understand the health department that we are not keeping up with the phones. Okay, we are overwhelmed with the amount of incoming phone calls and questions that we have, and we are working desperately on trying to figure out how to fix that. Um, if you can find this information on our website, on the CDC site, on the end, please go and follow those along um, because it's very, very hard for our staff right now. Um, to answer the phone and answer these general questions. And uh, I apologize for that, uh, but that's um, just where we're at. Doctor, I just yeah. wanted to also just mention one more thing. People can go back and watch these Facebook Lives again and again and again. They, sure. These are also on our YouTube channel. These are always available for people to review. So we also encourage mm -hmm. people to review because you answer so many, you and Justin answer so many of these questions each week the same. So. Right. Right, so share them. Yeah, that okay. and also remember that anytime you have a question and you want to make sure you get an answer, send an email to COVID19 at St. Clair uh, mm -hmm. And one, that creates a record and allows somebody to answer you. So that's a great way to alternatively answer your or get your questions answered. Thank you. Okay, somebody ask again, we talked about the dentist office and such, but if somebody needs medical care, is it safe to go to the doctor? Yeah. yeah, I believe it is. And it's important to go to your doctor. Uh, call ahead, find out what your doctor's policies are. Uh, they may want to do a telehealth visit or something like that, but please don't delay or put off your health care um, during this time. Um, it, it, it could be more dangerous than the virus itself. So uh, we know that um, excess mortality has occurred during this pandemic and not all of it from COVID. So, uh, you know, it's important to follow through with your health care. Thanks for that and question. I, would, I just want to say one thing on that too. If you need to go to the hospital, go to the hospital. If you if you have a condition that you think you need to go to the ER for, our ERs are safe. Go. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. They're busy. They're busy, but there are no hospitals that are currently diverting care, which is great right. news. Um, no one is diverting. Everyone's taking trauma. Everybody's taking people that are showing up. So by all means, um, yeah, great advice. Thank you, Justin. We've had several people who are thanking you both for all the hard work and kudos mm -hmm. for keeping the community informed. So that's always nice to hear. Um, this person asked that they are re they are a retired registered nurse with an underlying condition. Would it be safe for them to get to volunteer to give injections? I would want to vaccinate you first, honestly. I think I would run to vaccinate you first. And obviously that means we have to understand the vaccine and which vaccines are appropriate for someone with an immune compromised system. So uh, we'd love uh, for volunteers to contact yes. us. And that's a great, uh, Justin, you want to give them the information if they want to volunteer, we get them on our volunteer registry because that's something I think uh, we're definitely going to be trying to look for. So especially those of you who have some healthcare experience, where, yeah, would, they, so where would they send their name? Um, they, if they want to, they can send it to the COVID-19 email and you can also go on the, the, my volunteer registry, uh, just type in my volunteer, uh, in Google and uh, it'll come up with the website and that's it. It's M I not M Y. Uh, and that will allow you to, to hit our list of qualified volunteers. And we need okay. you. So please do that. Yeah, we need you. Somebody, 
address this in the beginning, but um, was the vaccine tested on people with pre-existing health conditions? And you had covered that. I believe earlier. there's some. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, somebody else asked, if you've been exposed to several positive people at work, how safe is it in healthcare with a mask to keep working? Um, so the CDC actually has a really nice table for healthcare workers, which levels of exposure are considered high enough risk where we'd still recommend, I, you know, um, restrictions of, of being around other people that quarantine versus if everyone was wearing appropriate PPE that we do le allow healthcare workers to continue to work uh, while under quarantine. Um, there are some situations if there's been a very high risk exposure, we still wouldn't recommend it. Um, so <clears throat> you can find that on the CDC website or again, throw that to our COVID-19. I'd be happy to show you the link. Speaking of that, and can you some, repeat the COVID-19 email? Someone I was just going to. So it's okay. COVID-19 at stclaircounty.org. S-T-C-L-A-I-R County. Right. All spelled out. Dot org. That S-A-I-N. Okay. Um, okay. I think we are all caught up on the questions. So, right. Doc, do you want to, or Justin, want to plug the um, last two community flu clinics? Or I can if you don't have that information. Jen, I don't have it in front of me. Do you mind? No, I don't. Okay. So, um, we have two flu clinics. Uh, one is tomorrow, Wednesday, December 9th from 5 to 7 here at the St. Clair County Health Department. You can register online at sccheal.co, um, or you can come in if you do not have an appointment. I believe walk-ins will be taken too. And then Saturday, December 12th, at from 10 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. at our Teen Health location, located on the campus of Port Huron High, we have a vaccine, a flu vaccine clinic, all ages, and also anyone under 18 who needs to catch up on their normal childhood immunizations, we can do those too. So again, you can register on our website or they are accepting walk-ups for that too. Okay, so that's it. It's 4 11. Do you guys wanna do closing comments? Well, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, you, um, I'll go first. I just wanna thank everyone for everything, for listening in, for your great questions, for caring about this. And um, I know um, how hard this is. Uh, and I, I'm feeling it. Uh, this is a rough virus. It's a, it's a rough virus. And, and I just want everyone to do their best because uh, Justin and I were just talking about this. We actually can look ahead and say, you know, maybe by this summer we will have a new life. I mean, we actually have hope here and we just have to get through this dark period and just not let our guard up. So hang in there. So all I can say is just hang in there because we're going to get through this and um, science is going to save us. Next. Yeah. And what I'll, what I'll say is, you know, the, the human part of us is really looking forward to something. And, and we, like doc said, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel now and it's actually getting brighter. Uh, six months ago, if you asked, we weren't able to get off the train track while the train was coming. And now we, we, are getting close to having an ability to step to the side. So I just, I'm asking everybody just to hang on, uh, do what you can to, to follow the COVID protocols as much as possible. Uh, I know that it's hard to every minute of every day, but do the best you can. Uh, and we thank you all for listening, for asking the questions. Uh, I'd also like to thank, uh, you know, our staff for everything they're doing. Uh, both on the EOC side and the health department side. And, uh, you know, that's, I can't say enough about how wonderful our staff is. So thank you all. Thanks to the community and we'll see you next week.